Good evening, brothers and sisters. All right, let's have a word of prayer real quick. Most wonderful Father in our God in heaven, Lord, we are thankful once again to be here. Father, we thank you for the Sabbath that is upon us. We ask for your spirit to be with us. Father, I pray that you would be with me as I present this message. I pray that the hearts and the minds of all who are in here will be open. And I pray that your love will permeate this place. In Jesus' name, amen. So this evening, I wanted to speak about our dedication to God. It was pretty, pretty recently I did a baby dedication and I was speaking to the couple and it, it was eye opening that this couple didn't really understand what dedication was. In fact, the, the way that they were taught the dedication of the baby was more similar to infant baptism. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure that each of us who are parents in here would like our kids to serve the Lord. And the, the couple was under the assumption that when you dedicated your child, that you were basically saying that this child with me is going to serve the Lord. But the history of the baby dedication was a little bit more than that. When you dedicated your child, you were committing your child to active service for the Lord. Right? The primary teaching would be to serve in the church. This would be by raising your children in a well-disciplined family with the intent of yielding primary service to God, right? When we look through the Bible, we meet a significant character. His name is Enoch. Do you know what Enoch means? Or dedicated. So listen to what the Spirit of Prophecy says regarding Enoch. This is Adventist Home, page 160, paragraph 5, to 161, paragraph 2. And I'm going to try to get through this quickly because I am tired and I know I see a lot of tired faces in here, especially the children. After the birth of his son, Enoch reached a higher experience. He was drawn into a closer relationship with God. He realized more fully his own obligations and responsibilities as a son of God. And as he saw the child's love for its father, its simple trust in his protection, as he felt the deep yearning, tenderness of his own heart for that firstborn son, he learned a precious lesson of the wonderful love of God to men in the gift of his son. And the confidence which the children of God may repose in their heavenly father a precious trust. The children are committed to their parents as a precious trust, which God will one day require at their hands. We should give to their training more time, more care, and more prayer. Of instruction. Remember that your sons and daughters and younger members are younger members of God's family. He has committed them to your care. 
to train and educate for heaven. You must render a, an account to him for the manner in which you discharge your sacred trust. In 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 27 and 28, it reads this, For this child I prayed, and the Lord hath given me my petition, which I asked him. Therefore also I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he liveth, he shall be lent to the Lord. Adventist Home, page 212, paragraph 4. The Father will bind his children to the throne of God by living faith, distrusting his own strength. He hangs his helpless soul on Jesus and takes hold of the strength of the Most High. Brethren, pray at home, in your family, night and morning. Pray earnestly in your closet. And while engaged in your daily labor, lift up the soul to God in prayer. It was thus that Enoch walked with God. The silent, fervent prayer of the soul will rise like holy incense to the throne of grace and will be as acceptable to God as if offered in the sanctuary. To all who thus seek him, Christ becomes a present help in time of need. They will be strong in the day of trial. That message was for the fathers. Now for the mothers. Adventist home, page 242, paragraph 3. Especially does the responsibility rest upon the mother. She by whose lifeblood the child is nourished and its physical frame built up imparts to it also mental and spiritual influences that tend to the shaping of mind and character. It was Jochebed, the Hebrew mother, whose strong in faith, was not afraid of the king's commandment, of whom Moses was born, the deliverer of Israel. It was Hannah, the woman of prayer and self-sacrifice and heavenly inspiration, who gave birth to Samuel, the heaven-instructed child, the incorruptible judge, the founder of Israel's sacred schools. It was Elizabeth, the king's woman, and kindred spirit of Mary of Nazareth, who was the mother of the Savior's herald. The world's debt to mothers. Listen. The day of God will reveal how much the world owes to godly mothers. For men who have been unflinching advocates of truth and reform, men who have been bold to do and dare, who have stood unshaken amid trials and temptation, men who chose the high and holy interests of truth and the glory of God before worldly honor or life itself. We all know, especially parents, that being a parent is difficult, right? However, according to the Bible, the position of a child is enviable. Look at what it says regarding the children in these verses. In Mark chapter 10, verse 13 to 16, and they brought young ch children to him that he should touch them. And his disciples rebuked those that brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was much displeased and said unto them, Suffer the little children to come unto me, and forbid them not. For of such is the kingdom of God. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. And he took them up in his arms, put his hands upon them, 
and bless them. But the question here is, what is the quality that children possess that makes them so special an example to us? What's that quality? Let's go to the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1 and 2. It says this, Be ye therefore imitators of God, as beloved children, and walk in love even as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for an odor of a sweet smell. The position of a child as it relates to the kingdom is described because children are moldable and they imitate their parents. In the book, Child Guidance, this is the instruction given to us parents. Children imitate their parents. Hence, great care should be taken to give them correct models. Parents who are kind and polite at home, while at the same time they are firm and decided, will see the same trials manifested in their children. If they are upright, honest, and honorable, their children will be quite likely to resemble them in these particulars. If they reverence and worship God, their children, trained in the same way, will not forget to serve him also. In the family, fathers and mothers should ever present before their children the example they wish to be imitated. They should manifest one to another a tender respect in word and look and action. They should make it manifest that the Holy Spirit is controlling them by representing to their children the character of Jesus Christ. The powers of imitation are strong. And in childhood and youth, when this faculty is most active, a perfect pattern should be set before the young. Children should have confidence in their parents and thus take in the lessons they would inculcate. Once again, being a parent is very difficult, right? We know that we're not perfect. And we know sometimes those imperfections our children will imitate. But there's hope, right? We have a helper. This is what must be done. Once again, Adventist Home, page 290, paragraph 1. For a period of time, the majesty of heaven, the king of glory, was only a babe in Bethlehem and could only represent the babe in its mother's arms. In childhood, he could only do the work of an obedient child, fulfilling the wishes of his parents. In doing such duties as would correspond to his ability as a child. This is all the children can do. And they should be so educated and instructed that they may follow Christ's example. Now, fathers and mothers, this is not just for the children. It's also for the children of God. Christ acted in a manner that blessed the household in which he was found. For he was subject to his parents and thus did missionary work in his home life. It is written, and the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. It is the precious privilege 
of teachers and parents to cooperate in teaching the children how to drink in the gladness of Christ's life by learning to follow his example. The Savior's early years were useful years. He was his mother's helper in the home, and he was just as verily fulfilled, fulfilling his commission when performing the duties of the home and working at the carpenter's bench as when he engaged in his work of public ministry. Feed the minds of your children, parents, with the example of Christ. But that example must be lived out in us. Right? This is what we must do. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 1 and 2, it says, Putting away, therefore, all wickedness and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings, as newborn babes long for the spiritual milk, which is without guile, that ye may grow thereby unto salvation. Parents, it's much more necessary for us to put these things off because we've got imitators. We have a high calling. We are stewards of the children of God. You know, there was a time when I was really frustrated in my Christian walk, I felt like God just wasn't hearing me. I felt like he really just wasn't hearing me. And I started complaining, moaning, groaning. And if people looked at me, they would see a despicable Christian. This was shortly after the birth of my youngest son. I was tired. I was stressed. After his birth, he had a condition that needed constant treatment. And I had so much to do in the church. When I came home, I was very, very tired. I came home one day. And my son was screaming at the top of his lungs. Just could not get him to stop. I changed his diaper. I tried to see if he wanted to nap. Everything I tried was not working. And then I grabbed the thing that he loved the most, which was his pacifier. And I'm trying to give it to him, but he's just screaming. He's just screaming and screaming and screaming. So I'm moving the pacifier around like it's right here. Just grab it. I know you want it. And the Lord said, stop and look. The Lord told me I was being kind of like my son. My way of escape was there, right? My comfort was there. I was just too into myself moaning, groaning, and complaining that I couldn't grab hold of it. And I got down on my knees and I prayed and I said, Lord, I need you to humble me. I need you to make me as a child. I need you to do for me what I can't do for myself. I need you now. Believe me, children are a blessing and they can teach us many lessons. But understand this, while they're teaching us, we're teaching them. Right?
In 9 LTMS letter 6, 1894, paragraph 7, this is what it see, says. God sees that it is necessary to oppose our will and our way and bring our human will into subjection. Whatever path God chooses for us, whatever way he ordains for our feet, that is the only path of safety. We are daily to cherish a spirit of childlike submission and pray that our eyes may be anointed with heavenly eyesight in order that we may discern the indications of the divine will. Lest we become confused in our ideas because our will seems to be all control. With the eye of faith, with childlike submission, as obedient children, we must look to God to follow his guidance, and difficulties will clear away. God sees that it is necessary to oppose our will. What does that mean? That means if you have committed to a relationship with Christ, you are committing to let him be in control, right? First Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 20. Brethren, be not children in mind, howbeit in malice be ye babes, but in mind be men. Soundness of mind is needed, especially in the home. The home is the first mission field, right? Soundness of mind is needed. The parents are to juggle the role of teacher and parent, right? Child Guidance, page 21, paragraph 1 to 5. This is what it says. The father and the mother should be the first teachers of their, home, of their children. Fathers and mothers need to understand their responsibility. The world is full of snares for the feet of the young. Multitudes are attracted by a life of selfish and sensual pleasure. They cannot discern the hidden dangers or the fearful ending of the path that seems to, to them the way of happiness. Through the indulgence of appetite and passion, their energies are wasted and millions are ruined for this world and for the world to come. Parents should remember that their children must encounter these temptations. The same things we are battling as adults, our children will one day have to battle. If not, are battling now. Even before the birth of the child, the preparation should begin that will, will enable it to fight successfully against the battle, of, to, to fight successfully the battle against evil. More than human wisdom is needed by parents at every step, that they may understand how best to educate their children for a useful and happy life here and for higher service and greater joy hereafter. The training of children constitutes an important part of God's plan for demonstrating the power of Christianity. What we do in our home, in our life, as far as rearing up our children, shows the power of Christianity. I was at the store one day, and there was a guy who was seemingly impatient going up and down the aisles. And I was talking to my, my kids, and he noticed that every time my children responded, they responded with respect. 
And he stopped, he turned around and he came up to me and he said, man, you've got some great kids there. He said, it's hard to hear children respond like that to their parents these days. Believe me, the training that you put into your children, people are watching. However, parents need not be discouraged in their duties. This is what Christ says in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you what? Rest. And to the church, Paul says in Galatians 6, 2, bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Mothers help the fathers, fathers help the mothers. Church, help the family. We all have a part to play in our dedication and commitment to God. And it would be well if we could help each other do so. Once again, the church is God's appointed institution to fill the communities with his love and care. Child Guidance, page 312, paragraph 2. God has appointed the church as a watchman to have a jealous care over the youth and children and as a sentinel to see the approach of the enemy and give warning of danger. But the church does not realize the situation. She is sleeping on guard. In this time of peril, fathers and mothers must arouse and work as for life, or many of the youth will be forever lost. Three thirteen, paragraph one says, as a church, as individuals, if we would stand clear in the judgment, we must make more liberal efforts for the training of our young people, that they may be better fitted for the various branches of the great work committed to our hands. We should lay wise plans in order that ingenious minds of those who have talent may be strengthened and disciplined and polished after the highest order, that the work of Christ may not be hindered for lack of skillful laborers who will do their work with earnest and fidelity. Let me tell you something. The world has enough laborers Right? The word of God says the harvest is ripe, but what? The laborers are few. So here's what we need to do. I see a lot. The first thing I noticed when I came here is the multitude of children. And personally, I love children. And I love their innocence. I love their faith, especially when it comes to the parents. Listen, we need, we need to be good examples for our children. They're committed into our care. And think about this. When you're dedicating your child, please don't think of it as, well, I just want my child to be a Christian. Think of it as this. I want my child to be a laborer in the field. There's not enough laborers for God, and we need to finish the work. Amen? Amen. Let's pray.
our kind and merciful Father. Father, foremost, I just want to thank you for all the families that are represented here. Lord, we, we know that man was created in your image and likeness, and when that image came forth, it was family. We know the importance as parents, as teachers, as leaders of investing in these children. And I pray that you would make us more aware of our duty. Father, I pray that you would do a work in us that the children can imitate. Father, it's our desire to be led by you, to have you control our will. We have submitted ourselves into your hands, and it's because we desire salvation not only for us, but for our children and for the world. Father, I pray that you would help our families to be a symbol of the family in heaven. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.